he found in the temple those selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money brokers in their seats. So, after making a whip of ropes, he drove all those with the sheep and cattle out of the temple, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he said to those selling the doves, Take these things away from here. Stop making the house of my father a house of commerce. Of course, the impact on the disciples, they recall that it is written, the zeal for your house will consume me. So we have learned in the past the whips, that was not for the humans, it's for the animals. Uh, This was a controlled, righteous, devoted man with indignation. How dare you? This temple was precious to Jesus, dear to his heart, And you scoundrels are in here commercializing where we worship Jehovah God. Jesus said, But when you spread a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be happy, because they have nothing with which to repay you. For you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous ones. According to Jesus' instructions, we should seek opportunities to extend generosity toward our brothers in need wherever they may be found, including our circuit overseers and others who are serving as full or part-time volunteers. And we should especially be conscious of those who are not in a position to repay us. And what of the practical needs of the organization? It continues to grow. So we need more Bibles, more literature, in more languages, and more kingdom halls. Recently, we were informed that we are in need of 14,000 additional kingdom halls worldwide. Can we generously share our time, our skills, and our resources to help fill that need? Parents, how can you use this video to teach your children to be generous? After they watch it again, ask them about what they saw. What did Sophia first think of doing with her coin? But what did she do instead? What changed her mind? How did she feel afterward, and why did she feel that way? And parents, what can you learn from this video? John 18 says that he bore witness to the truth. Well, in imitation of Jehovah and Jesus, we too endeavor to serve uh, with truth. At times, Jesus didn't always give people direct answers. Recall when the chief priest asked him by what authority he performs his miraculous signs. In that situation, Jesus didn't answer their question. And the reason why is because enemies of truth don't deserve information that they would use to harm God's servants. Likewise, we're not obligated to give truthful information to people who aren't entitled to it. The final way that Jesus displayed a zeal for true worship is his deep respect for the arrangement of true worship that Jehovah saw fit to use at that time. Now think about it. Jesus could have reasoned, hmm, I'm the son of God. And because of what the greedy merchandisers and their religious backers had done at the temple, I am justified to worship Jehovah apart from the temple arrangement. But as we know, he didn't do that, did he? And why didn't he do that? Because the temple was Jehovah's authorized arrangement at the time, and Jesus knew that God had not seen fit to replace it, despite all the abuses. So Jesus continued his worship at the temple despite the poor conduct of others. 
Likewise today, we can imitate Jesus by refusing to allow imperfections of others, hurt feelings that might occur to hinder our worship. Rather, we should zealously support pure worship by faithfully attending meetings and associating with the congregation despite any abuses we might recognize. Jesus didn't save himself. No, he fulfilled what he was asked to do. He remained faithful to death. Jesus never gave up in doing God's will. And what he started at his baptism, he finished at his death. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. He now called a crowd to him with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to come after me, let him disown himself and pick up his torture stake and keep following me. When we dedicated our lives to Jehovah, we promised to disown ourselves and yes, even to suffer if necessary to uphold Jehovah's sovereignty. Now, many today have lived up to their dedication despite facing serious illness, a family opposition, crushing disappointments, uh, facing perhaps the disfellowshipping of a, a fellow family member. But like Jesus, you too can make Jehovah's heart rejoice by remaining faithful to him. At this, Peter began to speak, and he said, Now I truly understand that God is not partial, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. We see how Jehovah truly has provided the best example of what his standards are. He is not allowing himself to be influenced by who we are on the outside, but it's truly what we do with the standards that he has set before us, if we agree and abide by them. Jehovah's love, though, is conditional, but only upon how we respond and act towards those requirements. Another thing we would be devoted about uh, is being resolute about not accepting employment that would prevent us from regular attendance at meetings or sharing in the ministry. It's not negotiable. We have to have our meetings. We have to share in the ministry. That's all. And we trust Jehovah to help us through it. Someone who ignores the counsel from the Bible, God's word calls them stupid. And our dealings with such an individual end badly. Uh, the Watchtower commenting on this verse has stated that in a way, we're like sponges. We absorb what we're surrounded with. So the point of this proverb is clear, isn't it, teenagers? Choose your friends carefully. Uh, walk with the wise. Walk with those who adhere to God's word as the standard. Associate with them. And even if you can't find an individual your age nearby to associate with, remember, having no associates is better than having bad ones. Be well, I face peer pressure. My school is very small, so because of that, the pressure is definitely amplified because everybody knows me. Can you give an example? Sure. So the kids at school, every weekend, they have a party. And then the week following, they talk about everything that they did. So being one of the few people who isn't included in these things, I really stand out. And the pressure got even more severe recently with the prom. Um, I was surrounded by people every day, all day, talking about things from shoes to dresses to who got a promposal, which is when you get asked to the prom. And then when I was asked and I said no, there was definitely a lot of pressure because so many people were talking about it. Now, how did that, a pressure, how did that pressure affect you? Well, all those after school things that they were doing, whether it was shopping trips or having a party or going to the movies, it brought them closer and it made me feel left out at times. And sometimes I even felt like I wanted to be more included or accepted by them. And on top of that, it got awkward constantly declining invitations because I didn't want to seem rude or offend them. But still, despite this backing, some youths still reason in their hearts it's best for me not to make a dedication to God. They excuse themselves as being too young or not ready for that responsibility. Is this the type of thinking that leads to us being favorably heard by God? It's good to see how serious you're taking baptism. It's the biggest step that you'll ever take in your life. 
but you shouldn't let fear hold you back from getting baptized. You didn't let fear that you might get in an accident hold you back from getting a license, although that can help you to drive more cautiously. So why would you hold back from getting baptized if you qualify? I mean, Caleb, you've been coming to meetings since you were a little kid. You give really good comments and parts in the theocratic ministry school, and you do excellent out in the field ministry. Well, yeah, but if I don't get baptized, I don't have to worry about the consequences of doing something wrong. Well, Caleb, don't be so sure about that, because the Bible makes it very clear that if someone knows how to do what's right and they don't do it, that it's a sin for them. So don't think that just by putting off baptism, you can avoid being accountable, because once you reach the age of responsibility, you're, act you're accountable for your actions, whether you're baptized or not. Well, what age is that? Well, I can't say. The fact that you're even asking questions like these means that you've probably already reached it. Oh, man, Logan. Jehovah appreciates and rewards the right kind of fear. Uh, we attended the meetings regularly. Um, the children knew that Saturday mornings were for field service, and every week we had a family worship. And we also, uh, at one point, changed our family worship night to Friday night, and uh, it, it coupled with that a family fun night, and where we spent quality time with just us as a family. So it sounds like you two set a great example in training your children spiritually. However, at a certain point, you mentioned something changed with one of your children. Could you share that with us? Well, at one point, uh, one of our children took a job and was exposed to questionable association with coworkers. And sadly, this led to a disfellowshipping. Tell us, how did you handle that bitter disappointment? Well, it was one of the hardest things that I ever had to face. I had uh, many sleepless nights praying to Jehovah, but I came to realize that we needed to trust in what Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says, train a boy in the way he should go. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. And we began to question ourselves as parents. I mean, where did we go wrong? Were we too strict? Were we too lenient? Just what did we do that was wrong? But one thing we did for sure, and that's in addition to multiple times with praying to Jehovah, we made sure that we cling to our spiritual routine. So we understand that your child is doing well spiritually, and I'm very happy about that. What was it that moved your child to return to Jehovah? Well, it was the missed association with the family, and here's why. I had always told her kids, well, I told her kids that I would die for you, I love you, would die for you, but if you ever leave Jehovah, I wouldn't be there. And they knew that we wouldn't waver on this. But sad to say, and as hard as it was, we had to cut off all association. So well, it was the beginning of a school year, uh, the second day in actually, and this girl comes up to me and she says, Gavin, uh, we should go to the movies. You should take me to the movies. It kind of come as a shock, but because I knew ahead of time what my answer would be, I said no. Uh, she didn't take it right away. She did try to persuade me a little bit, uh, saying it wasn't a big deal, it was just the movies. Well, Jehovah's happy you said no, but how did you say that? Well, uh, I wasn't rude. I tried to be firm uh, and show in my conviction what my response was. So she, got, she definitely got the point. By today's standards, going to the movies with a girl really isn't a big deal, or anyone with the opposite gender. Uh, but I knew that it could easily lead to something more serious, something that while Satan wanted me to do, uh, Jehovah, my creator, didn't want me to do. So knowing that really made it easier for me to say, in effect, go away, Satan. I didn't identify myself as one of Jehovah's Witnesses because I was scared of what kids at school would say about me. Peer pressure probably is probably the worst one because um, you know you don't get just peer pressure from friends but you also get it from you know your teachers. Some of my friends who joined this new Christian group started spreading false rumors about Jehovah's Witnesses. Many of them said we were led by some unknown leader at the top. At first I wanted to stand up and say, well, that's not true. However, I started becoming fearful. Um, the teacher at school was mocking all religions, saying, you know, the Bible is outdated. You know, how can you know God exists? You know, people have rewritten it so many times. How can you know it's the truth? And I remember thinking to myself, oh, I should say something. You know, I did this the night before. I should say something. 
And then my friend goes next to me, goes, Bianca's a Jehovah's Witness. The teacher looks at me, you know, wide open, goes, do you have anything to say? And I just, I just stood there, you know, didn't know what to say. And then the bell rang and I was just like relieved. I felt how I imagined Peter would have felt. My conscience kept bothering me and I knew that Jehovah didn't approve of my association. The fact that I had to open my mouth and kind of prove myself, you know, just it cramped up inside and you know, I felt very disappointed in myself. And I was raised around the truth. When I was nine years old, I had become an unbaptized publisher for a few years and I was on the Theocratic Ministry School and I had goals to get baptized and to one day be a missionary. Very nice. So that's good to hear. You must have had a strong foundation. Well, not exactly. Um, my mother got disfellowshipped and my parents got divorced. And <laughs> my parents, my mother got disfellowshipped and my parents got divorced. And as hard as my dad tried raising us in the truth, without me being firmly uh, rooted in the truth, without being firmly rooted in the truth personally, I started to get involved with school friends, sneaking out of the house with my worldly boyfriend who did drugs, smoking, and drinking. The elders simply want to find out how are you doing and what we could do to be of assistance. It's just been so difficult lately. Wendy, we feel really sorry what you're going through. But please, follow along, paragraph 3. Jehovah never forgets his worshipers who stray from the fall. On the contrary, he reaches out to them, often doing so through their fellow believers. That's why we're here. We want to help. Please, tell us what you're going through. We're all ears. After hearing our sister out, the elders show her the table of contents on page 3 of the brochure. They explain the various parts and which one would seem to apply best to her situation. And then they encourage her to read it as soon as possible. But, uh, we weren't there to do anything other than try to help her regain her closeness with Jehovah God. And the thing we always like to emphasize with them, see, the positive thing is you didn't forget Jehovah. You didn't forget his commandments, did you? And they don't. They don't. Uh, when you love Jehovah, you don't forget him. See, and when they leave, it's always there because with his spirit or whatever he's doing, he uh, is trying to draw them back. Uh, otherwise, uh, they're going to have to go the way of those that are actually enemies of his. That a wife's work is in, that is in support of her husband can greatly benefit her family. She shows her support both by communicating the needs of the family and then shopping wisely. She works hard and efficiently coordinates 
the needs of the family. Most importantly, though, a capable wife is one who fears Jehovah and serves him wholeheartedly. Then, of course, she assists her husband in teaching her children to do the same. How does a supportive wife feel when her husband is given additional Christian activities in the congregation? Well, she's happy with this privilege. Actively supporting her husband, both by word and by actions, will definitely involve sacrifice for her. And yet, she realizes that her husband's involvement in the congregation keeps her family grounded and helps them to keep spiritually awake. Emergency response services have complained that they receive many cell phone calls over minor matters. If a medical emergency arises at the convention site, please contact a nearby attendant who will immediately notify first aid so that our first aid personnel can render assistance and call 911 as needed. You may be seated. We know that as a group, the Pharisees were pompous, hypocritical, and under the influence of the devil. Totally opposite of that was Jesus. Now, both of them served their fathers. Jehovah did the desire, or Jesus did the desires of Jehovah, whereas the Pharisees did the desires of their father, Satan the devil. But why this talk about the Pharisees in a convention about Jesus? Well, it's simple. We look at a good example and a bad example, and we're able to benefit. When we look at Jesus, we appreciate the fine qualities that he did imitating his father. When we look at the Pharisees, we see bad examples of them imitating their father. And we don't want to go into the pitfall of what they did, being overly righteous. So here's the question. Are we just as determined to get rid of any materialistic tendencies in our heart. Now let that sink in. See, are we just as determined, in imitation of Jesus, to get rid of any materialistic tendencies in our heart? So we'll give you an example. And this is being addressed at this convention. You already heard comments yesterday. We make this point here, and we're going to elaborate a little bit, because it's really offensive to spiritual people. And it's offensive to Jehovah God. It is not proper to use congregation meetings as a venue for selling or promoting commercial products or services. This is not new. Mm -mm. That is dead wrong. There is no justification for it. Don't say, well, it's practical, uh, you know, to bring the products to the kingdom hall. And I just drop them off and I try to keep it discreet. No. You lost discreet when you brought it there. Shane, even before I came to the truth, I always had a feeling that my son's addictions may lead to a premature death. But I never imagined that he would be able to take his own life. I just, I just can't understand that. Thanks for calling and coming over. Ken, we really want to be here for you. We're so saddened by the loss that you're experiencing. You know, we've been praying, Sabrina and I, specifically about you to Jehovah. And I actually took some time before I came over today to uh, preview some articles that I think will really help you in dealing with some of the feelings that you're having, but also showing you some real comfort. Do you mind if I show you how I went about finding them and we take a look at a couple of them? No, I, I didn't enjoy that. I can use all the encouragement I can get right now. Well, Ken, I know you're familiar with the Watchtower Online Library, but maybe you'll benefit from this section here under Publications. And notice down here the Research Guide. I've seen that before, but I haven't become familiar with that. Well, notice here under the subjects. Here, this subject, death, is shown. Now, just down here a little ways under this subheading, notice death of a child. Okay. I noticed a couple of articles that I really feel are going to help you with some of the feelings and also bring you some comfort. This first one, really for parents, a deep and lasting pain. But then one that really brings comfort, help from the God who supplies endurance and comfort. 
Well, look right down here. There's a heading for suicide. I'm actually glad you pointed that out. There was an article there that I think is really going to help you. It's, you can find help. Would it be okay if I spent a little bit of time, more time looking at some of the points in that article? I think it's really going to help you with some of the feelings that you've been experiencing. Yes, I'd really like to see what that article says. Okay, well, at the bottom of this article, let's take a look at it. There's a teaching box that says, Have you lost a loved one to suicide? And notice the scripture right in the middle of the paragraph. It's Proverbs 14.10. Let's open that up. It says, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider can share in its joy. And notice how the slave's words say, It's simply impossible to discern what another person is thinking and feeling. Wow. And certainly that's something that you've uh, been struggling with, I'm sure. But maybe I could say a prayer with you now, and we could go over some other comforting thoughts that we can find in the scriptures together. That sounds good, and thanks so much for pointing this out to me. I can really feel that Jehovah's given me just what I need right now. That poor woman, all she needed was somebody to talk to. And that sister noticed that. She stepped up, she took the initiative, and she listened intently. It very much could mean the, the difference in that woman's life. Friends, we are living in a world that's cold, it's dark, and it's scary. The friends in our area, the people, they need our help before it's too late. Be like Jesus. Be bold, be thorough, and please, by all means, be approachable. see just salt? Did you see something that Jesus was trying to teach? Well, turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verse 50. We especially want to concentrate on how Jesus used salt as a word picture, but really he was especially interested in his ability to enhance food as he was teaching his disciples. You know, salt makes food better, doesn't it? Can you imagine eating a potato chip or french fry without salt? Mm-mm, not going to do it. It makes food better, it enhances food. So in this light, salt can enhance us as brothers and sisters. It can make Christians better. And let's see how a sister, she's in the ministry. She seasons her words with salt. She turns a conversation stopper into a flavorful discussion. Now we have an experience of one brother who was raised as a witness. His father was a respected elder in the congregation, and our brother was baptized at the age of 14. Well, can we say his house was built on the rock? Well, really, we cannot tell. Those are all external things. The truth was his foundation was not strong. 
Our brother soon experienced winds against him with difficulties in life, including his father leaving Jehovah and never returning to the truth. Then the floods came against him. His marriage failed. His wife ran off with someone else. She was disfellowshipped from the congregation, and then she had him kicked out of his own home. Yes, his house collapsed and was ruined. He became very bitter. He wondered, how could this be his reward for not leaving the truth all these years? The reality was, however, he was not really in the truth. Yes, though he was coming to congregation meetings, he says even this about his own feelings. He says, I managed to play by the rules just enough not to be removed from the congregation. Well, does this sound like someone who is really rooted in the faith? Well, loving and caring elder in the congregation helped him to realize for the first time what it meant to rely on Jehovah. Even though he was raised around the truth, he said for the first time he was now developing an actual faith. He volunteered on theocratic projects and worked with RBC. And interestingly, he was, help, he was used to help others deal with literal winds, rains, and floods, following with the uh, cleanup efforts and rebuilding efforts following Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. Today, he serves as an elder and as a volunteer working on the Warwick Project. Well, what is the lesson for us today? Jehovah knows how hard you work to provide for your family all the while putting kingdom interest first in your life. If he can provide for the birds of the heavens, he will care for our different needs, our different circumstances, and the challenges we face. You are worth more than birds. Simplicity. Use language and illustrations that are easy to understand. Uh, simple words that even a child could grasp. We could take time to consider our simplified watchtower as a good example. And illustrations, they don't need to be complicated. They don't need to be a novel. Uh, we recall Jesus used a lot of one-liners, we could say, about everyday things, about salt and birds and flowers, sheep, coins. People could relate to it. If an eight-year-old child can understand our illustration, then we're probably on the right track. Simplicity. For the Father is greater than I am. See the two points? Going away to the Father, or is he going away to himself? And he's very clearly stating his position in relation to his father, Jehovah. Jehovah was superior to him. Another famous scripture that we've read many times, but it's a nice point to reason on with uh, those who believe that Jesus is God. In Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus said, all authority is has been given me on heaven and on earth. Well, who gave him that authority? See, and where did that come from? So we recognize that uh, these are some nice reasoning points to help establish Jesus' position in relation to his Father. Now, some will listen to the reasoning found in the Bible. We appreciate that, but others prefer to cling to their mistaken thoughts. There was one group of people that did acknowledge our belief in Jesus. You might find this reference of interest. According to the New Catholic Encyclopedia, version 1967 in volume 7, on page 864, they have a little section about Jehovah's Witnesses. They consider Jesus as the greatest of Jehovah's Witnesses. A God, as spoken of in John 1.1, 1, 1, inferior to no one but Jehovah. Before existing as a human being, he was a spirit creature called the Logos, or Word, or Michael, the Archangel. He died as a man and was raised as an immortal spirit son. His passion and death were the the price he paid to regain for mankind the right to live eternally on earth. Well, they got it right. If you remember, Luke 21, verse 24, said that Jerusalem would be trampled on by the nations until the appointed times of the nations are fulfilled. 
Now, we know that began in 607 BCE. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 16, it said that seven times would have to pass over it. And in Revelation 12, verse 6 and 14, it indicates that three and a half times equals 1,260 days. So seven times would be 2,520 days. But of course, we've got the Bible principle, Numbers 14, verse 34, a day for a year, a day for a year. So that 2,520 days would be 2,520 years. So counting 2,520 years from 607 BCE brings us to 1914, when Jesus began to rule as king in the heavens. You got it now. Um, it's still not clear. That's okay. I didn't understand it the first time I went through it. Matthew 5 and verse 9, it says, Happy are the peacemakers, since they will be called sons of God. So this is the prospect that we have. By being peacemakers, by imitating Jesus, who's imitating Jehovah, uh, we show that we want to be sons of God. And that's a realistic prospect that we can have. It's sooner for the anointed, but those with the hope on earth get that wonderful blessing and hope too. And I'm minded of uh, was raising our sons, uh, uh, was self-employed, had the business going, a business venture. And I always remember this, uh, amongst others. So I'm in the dining room at the assembly hall there in New England, and this sister's trying to talk to me. It didn't have to be a, it could have been a brother, it just happened to be a sister, about business that I was in. And, her interest in this, and I looked and I said, sister, I don't conduct business at the assembly hall or a kingdom hall. Yeah, but Brother Morris, this is the dining room. <laughs> what do you do? Uh, materialistic? Oh, yeah. Money. And I tried to be as kind as I could, but I was not going to have anything to do with that. So if, I, if I'm going to make my Heavenly Father happy and it hurts your feelings, I'll sleep that night. <laughs> okay. We try to be kind, but did Jesus say, I hope I didn't hurt the Pharisees' feelings uh, when I behaved that way. Now, I don't have that kind of authority to go the length he did. Nonetheless, it's that devotion to Jehovah God. That is not proper. It's got to be stopped. And uh, you'll see a Watchtower study coming up in the months ahead. It's already out. I can't always remember how many are older because we got in, uh, a couple years ahead. But I know this one is printed and has its pictures and everything. So you'll be seeing more about that because of our love for Jehovah.